Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael David Fox. I'm the director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, East European Studies at Georgetown. And it's a great pleasure to uh, moderate and host this uh, session of Russia Brief. Uh, Russia Brief is, is, is hosted by Ceres. It is sponsored by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And it is led by Jill Doherty, who's an adjunct professor at Georgetown based in Ceres. She's a former CNN White House correspondent, a former CNN State Department correspondent, and a former Moscow bureau chief as well. I'm delighted to introduce Jill, who will lead the session. Okay, so well, thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate that. And welcome to Ceres as you are new director, so I salute you. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, tell our audience, and I'm really glad you're tuning in. Uh, you know, when we first planned this discussion, which was actually at least a month, if not more ago, I wanted to do a deep dive, as we say in Washington, into the issue of migration, uh, but kind of a different migration, sadly, than what we are seeing unfolding on our TV screens and on the web. Web, uh, in all its horror on the uh, Belarus-Poland border. As everyone knows right now, migrants from the primarily the Middle East and even Asia are fleeing military conflict, economic privation, and they are trying to transit through Belarus into Europe. The West is accusing Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko of weaponizing migration. And I saw one observer calling it controlled instability, which I think is a really good uh, explanation of what is going on right there. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and we are gonna talk about that briefly at the top. And then we will turn to the subject du jour, uh, also talking about other, we'll call them migrants, but they are a different type. They are the Belarusians who have fled their country under the Lukashenko regime and are currently living in Europe, primarily Eastern Europe and the Baltics, Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland. And we have two guests who are positioned uniquely to talk about this. I'll introduce them. And before I do, I just want to give everyone an idea of how we will do this. We have an hour. So we'll uh, d jump into the discussion about the border crisis right now. And then we will pivot to the other story about expats from Belarus. And we'll go for probably about a half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, and then we will open it to questions. I'm really eager to get some questions from the audience. So you can be thinking about those and we will use the Q&A function on your screen at the bottom where you can pop those questions in. So <clears throat> let's start. Two guests, the first is Ala Luka Vets. Her area of expertise is the uh, foreign policy of Belarus and other Eastern partnership countries, as well as elections and electoral protests in non-democratic regimes. She holds a PhD in political science from Bremen International Graduate School of Social Sciences in Germany. She recently finished postdoctoral programs in electoral studies at the University of Tartu in Estonia and the University of Leipzig, Germany. Uh, finally, she's carried out quite a bit of research at the Harvard uh, Davis Center, European Parliament in Brussels, and the UK Parliament in London. Then we also have Maximus Milta. He is a Rethink CEE fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the US. And he is also an associate analyst at the Eastern European Studies Center. And uh, Maximus, whom I actually have gotten to know pretty well, uh, is originally from Vilnius, Lithuania, but he grew up spending about 15 years of his early uh, life in Minsk, Belarus. For the last eight years, Maximus has worked at the European Humanities University, which is based in Vilnius, that is the Belarusian university in exile, leading communications and development. And he's a frequent commentator on Belarus affairs for international media. And I should mention a plug, which is quite interesting, a new project 
brand new 10 episode documentary exploring the role of women in mobilizing Belarusian society. And that's being broadcast on Lithuanian national TV. Uh, for those who are interested, we can uh, provide a link because there is one chapter, one episode that is translated into English. And it's very, very interesting. So currently, um, Maximus is a graduate student in European and Russian studies at Yale. So both of our guests, although they are certainly from Europe, are here in the United States at this point. So let's begin with the situation at the Polish-Belarus border. And um, I think maybe, Ala, we will begin with you. I'm just going to ask a big question, you know, kind of broad question, which is, why is this happening? Why all of a sudden do we see these migrants on the border? And do you agree with that uh, accusation of Lukashenko that he is um, weaponizing migrants? Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Jill, for invitation to join this, this panel. It's, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, you have raised a fundamental question, and um, I think that Lukashenko, what, what he's doing, he's clearly instrumentalizing migrants for his political purposes by using these uh, hybrid warfare tactics and luring migrants for, from uh, impoverished countries in Iraq, in Africa, in, sorry, in Middle East, in, in Africa, and then pushing them to, to the EU uh, borders, he's basically trying to retaliate for the EU sanctions, um, which were introduced this year as well as last year. So he has created this refugee crisis at the borders and um, accused the EU of violating human rights by refusing to allow the migrants uh, to apply for asylum. And this is basically his way of saying that he and his interests need to be taken into account, uh, that he is he's not going to allow um, the EU to exert democratizing pressure uh, on, on Belarus and on Lukashenko and to stage uh, a color revolution, as he uh, always likes to say. Um, and um, it seems that he, he he's ready to go far with, with this uh, bargaining game, so to say. He has also recently signaled that he is ready to enlarge his set of countermeasures against the EU um, uh, by saying that he, he will cut off gas supplies uh, to, to, to Poland and Germany. And uh, although um, Kremlin said that um, this, this is not likely uh, and uh, Russia will honor its, its, its agreements uh, with the EU, its contractual agreements with the EU, uh, one should be ready for, for, for anything because Lukashenko is known for his chaotic and unpredictable moves uh, in the critical situations. Um, so. It appears that Allah's signal has frozen. Is that correct? I think we are. Michael, do you see the same thing I'm saying? I do see that. So she'll probably have to log on. Probably. Um, but those were interesting remarks. And I wonder how much it is a winning strategy for Lukashenko. He's not making a lot of friends in Moscow with his threats. And I don't. it's sort of the hostage taking. Is it a successful strategy? So I think I'd like, if she comes back, Maybe we'll learn more. Maybe we can turn to Maximus then. Maximus, um, actually, the questions that Michael just asked, um, I think are fantastic. Do you want to jump in there? And, and I do want to, if you can briefly get into this idea that many people have been putting out there, that it's actually Putin behind the scenes pulling the strings and orchestrating all of this. Sure. And uh, thank you, Jill, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here on this panel. Uh, also, it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, Michael, and uh, going ahead with your initial question on hostage taking. Well, this has been the tactics of Lukashenko regime for the last 20 years. So this is, of course, not a novelty for him. 
rather the scope and the geography has shifted. But uh, generally speaking, uh, 2001 year onwards, uh, and 2001 were the first presidential elections that were fraudulent in Belarus. And before that, there was a series of referenda that were also conducted in a fraudulent manner. Since that time on, Lukashenko had the, developed this pattern of hostage taking as a bargaining power when it comes to negotiating with uh, the West uh, in order to pursue with his own interests. And interests have been uh, twofold. First, legitimization of Lukashenko. And the second, of course, is the uh, supplementary financial flow from the West, which could be serving as additional bargaining power in Lukashenko's relationships with Kremlin. So therefore, uh, this has been an important aspect of his uh, tactical uh, decision making for the last 20 years. And what we see now, uh, and in particular, the development of, uh, of yesterday, when Chancellor Merkel uh, has uh, reached out to Lukashenko, and although uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, secretary has disseminated media release underlining that this was a phone conversation with Mr. Lukashenko, not President Lukashenko. Still, if you watched Belarusian uh, state propaganda yesterday, it was showcased as a triumph of Lukashenko regime, as a triumph of, of Minsk when it comes to the whole pattern. And uh, naturally, uh, it is also a very worrying development. On one end, we can definitely agree that uh, Chancellor Merkel being a matriarch of European politics and in her particular role right now, when it's only the question of weeks of her still remaining in the office, she can allow herself to make the moves that the incoming uh, Chancellor Schulz would not be able to do. So of course she is placed in a unique position to be able to reach out to Lukashenko, yet uh, this is definitely something that has allowed for, you know, for the state propaganda to demonstrate again the triumph. and. Uh, I would not interpret call, uh, Merkel's call to Lukashenko as, uh, uh, let's say, as a, as a dramatic divert of uh, Brussels uh, non-recognition policy for Lukashenko, but definitely you cannot win hearts and minds, especially in places like Warsaw and in places like Vilnius and also Riga, when you talk about Belarus external borders, for example, with Poland, surpassing Warsaw and doing that directly with whether it be Moscow or Minsk. So definitely this does not contribute to ensuring mutual understanding. And it is also a certain pattern of, uh, you know, in German, there is this term Zwischenländer, you know, the in-between countries, right? So defining the region between Germany and Russia. So Berlin's approach to Zwischenländer has been quite uh, debatable uh, for, for many decades. And there were also very uh, troublesome historical precedents whenever Berlin was doing that uh, on pair with Moscow surpassing capitals in between. So uh, that's uh, that's for hostage taking and in the past uh, taking hostages has been quite successful for Lukashenko because that was the bargaining power in order to uh, reverse uh, the sanctions that being imposed for Lukashenko and sanctions again is not a novelty. Uh, the very first instance when sanctions were applied uh, were, were, uh, to Lukashenko happened even the, before year 2000. Uh, so it has been more than 20 years of history of, of, of sanctions from the West to Lukashenko. And every now and then, uh, hostage taking was uh, the approach utilized by Lukashenko to downsize on sanctions. And then the question of elections, the question of electoral legitimacy would be dropped out as out of question. So uh, the underlining point that I want to stress here is it is really disappointing and worrying that it's not almost 850 political prisoners. It's not 40,000 people that were detained in the course of last year that are the reason for Brussels and particularly Berlin's proactive engagement now, but it's rather a few thousand of people who are attempting to cross the border illegally that serve as the catalyst to act. So this demonstrates a certain um, uh, you know, a, a, a certain, again, uh, questions in the, uh, in the pattern of EU's behavior when it comes to addressing the case of Belarus. And ultimately, it can also lose hearts and minds of Belarusians when it comes to their European aspirations in broader sense, not in geopolitical, but in broader sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So these were just a few points, Michael, re reacting on, 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 on what, what were, were you saying, of course, yes. Maximus, um, I'm for, I did see Ala kind of pop up again, but she is probably having some type of communication problem. So I think we're going to continue. And Michael, please feel free to jump in here. Let's turn to the subject um, at hand. And let me just pull up um, a 
a couple of notes here because, you know, Maximus, your personal history began in Lithuania. And um, now Lithuania, you know, uh, uh, Vilnius seems to be the unofficial capital for many Belarusians who have fled. So I guess the underlying question is why is this happening to such an extent? And how is Lukashenko dealing with this wave of exiles? Well, there is, of course, a certain level of symbolism and irony that in today's uh, conversation we have words Belarus in exile in one sentence, in one headline, because it has become a certain historical pattern of uh, Belarusians and their particular political, uh, you know, and, 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 and political life of, of Belarusians that exile has always been one of the inevitable components of that. And if we look at the course of the last uh, century, for instance, uh, Belarusians, they, you know, they have developed a certain know-how, you know, a certain practical wisdom, you know, phronesis in Greek terms of what does it mean to be in exile. And even if you, you know, if you check Wikipedia, it says that the longest serving government in exile is actually the Council of Belarusian People's Republic. And Belarusian People's Republic was an attempt to establish independent Belarusian state uh, in the aftermath of the First World War. Actually, it was proclaimed on March 25th, 1918. And until now, more than 100 years afterwards, it's still, there, there, there is still a chairwoman of uh, Council of uh, Belarusian People's Republic. She's based in Canada. And uh, they, of course, um, have more like a symbolic position, but still, this is also is quite telling that the uh, Belarusians for almost, almost 100 years, they have even a government in exile. Now, if we look into more details and different subjects, not only when it comes to political life being in exile, but also questions like religion and exile. Again, Belarusians have been already for a century somehow connecting these two dots together because both the Belarusian Greek or Catholic Church and Belarusian autocephalic Orthodox Church, they also have been operating for most of this last century being in exile. When it comes to a Belarusian uh, cultural life, well, it's, uh, it's, it's essential to say that uh, a significant part of Belarusian uh, literature of the 20th century, it has been actually written in exile, whether it be Vilnius or Warsaw. Uh, lastly, uh, saying uh, if we look at the um, developments after 1990, and uh, when Lukashenko made his first attempt at uh, you know conducting those fraudulent uh, constitutional reforms uh, you know, in 1995, 1996, it followed with the uh, deconstruction of the existing Supreme Council of Belarus. So they switched to the model of having two chambers within the parliament. And the existing um, uh, ex existing House of uh, Supreme uh, Council of Belarus, they did not recognize uh, the constitutional change, and again, it remained to operate in exile. If you look into thousands, uh, you know, Belarusian Humanities Museum was shut down and has gone into exile first to Vilnius, then to Lithuania. The very same European Humanities University that you have mentioned, where I've been working for the last eight years, it has also gone into exile and continues to operate as a university in exile for Belarusians. So exile has been leading Belarusians for more than just Lukashenko's rule. There is something, uh, something intrinsic to exile and Belarusian political you know, life in general, I would say. And of course, in, the, in mapping out Belarusian exile, Vilnius has been emerging as a very important place of that for evident historical and cultural ties. And uh, in many regards, Vilnius has been considered by Belarusian as a as I say, there is a term of Piemont as, a, as an orientation point, focal point in, uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, because that was the city where the first political party, the first newspaper emerged, the first uh, grammar school, the first Belarusian high school was open actually in Vilnius. So, uh, of course, the, uh, my hometown of Vilnius has lots of connections and important aspects when it comes to forming uh, what does Belarusian is, is in general and how has it evolved. Uh, but naturally now, uh, the scale has been unprecedented. And we talk not only about uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovska and her team, but also about thousands and thousands of Belarusians who are quite untypical, um, you know, uh, people of exile in this regard. And I talk mostly about uh, those uh, aspirational entrepreneurs and uh, businessmen and businesswomen and uh, um, people who represent the various creative industries and journalists. So this wave uh, of, of, of fleeing Belarus that has happened after um, August 9th, 2020 has been quite unprecedented. And obviously it has 
you know, brought up the notion of exile for Belarusians even, even closer. And uh, naturally, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to that because at least be, when you choose between being in jail and being in exile, naturally being in exile at least provides an opportunity to contribute. Uh, to various uh, aspects of your life, whether it be media or whether it be you know pol political life, but at the same time, the scope of exile that has happened in the course of last year has been very worrying, and it is evident that uh, if change in Belarus happens, it will start on the ground in in cities of Belarus, in Minsk and the other places, not Vilnius, not Warsaw, not Kiev, neither Riga, and this is probably this this paradox uh, that remains in place and we should keep in mind. But again, exile is a very unique feature and characteristic of Belarusian political and cultural life of the last 100 years, right? Do we know how many right now, uh, let's say exiles are in Eastern Europe, Baltics, roughly? <laughs> As, as always it is with Belarusian studies, one of the most challenging aspects of it is the lack of verifiable statistics and lack of, lack of sociology. Uh, it is evident why statistics cannot be trusted when it's produced by Belarusian regime, but also there is a certain gap in that clear knowledge, but uh, the, the estimation that sounds to be um, plausible is around 100,000 of people who have uh, left. Again, it can be debated on the proportions, uh, but uh, generally speaking, this is the amount of people who fled and the main destinations for them have been Vilnius, Warsaw and Kiev and partially Riga, but mostly it distributed between Vilnius, Warsaw and Kiev. Well, if it's 100,000, um, that is significant in a country with how many people? Nine million, is it? Nine, nine, nine point six, nine point six. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty significant number. And um, and Michael, again, feel free to jump in. Yeah, here. I actually um, have a few couple of points here because um, uh, Maximus talked about the history of Vilnius and in Belarusian exile and um, I happen to be a historian, and um, I wonder if, you know, today's Vilnius, so different from interwar Vilnius, or even, at, you know, after the Russian Revolution, right, when it was a multi-ethnic city, when you had a large Jewish and um, Polish and uh, population, and, you know, this was an incubator in part for various nationalisms and so forth. But now you have a much different Vilnius. So that's one question, like how are conditions in Vilnius sort of interacting with this as a new home of, of exile? But, you know, and you made the point that it's, you know, most important for any action to come, will come from within Belarus, but it, is there a particular magnet for the intelligentsia here, given the university there, given the exile of intellectuals? So I'd be really interested in hearing about that aspect. The numbers are one thing overall, but if it's a magnet for the intelligentsia, then that can be a kind of important, you know, sort of if there's an intelligentsia in exile, that could be really important for the future. Right. Well, th these are wonderful questions, Michael. And uh, first, uh, kicking off with uh, with the demographics, you know, and the ethical composition of Vilnius. Of course, it goes without saying that it has dramatically shifted in the course of last century. And uh, naturally, Holocaust has been a, a, an enormous tragedy across the world, and especially in places like Vilnius, where uh, the Jewish heritage has been flourishing for for centuries. And uh, and uh, often uh, labeled as the Jerusalem of North, uh, Vilnius has naturally lost a very significant part of its identity with the Jewish presence because 95% of the Jewish population were exterminated uh, as a result of Holocaust. Now, at the same time, I would not uh, say that when it comes to ethical composition of Vilnius, it is mono-ethnic uh, city as, for instance, the second largest city in Lithuania, Kolnus is where in Konos, definitely you can see it's a very mono-ethnic place. Still, when it comes to uh, Vilnius in the map of, uh, of Lithuania, this is probably the most ethnically diverse city. 
And uh, there are different indicators that can illustrate that other than just the proportions of the Polish population, Russian and Belarusian population. And the Polish minority still remains the largest minority in Lithuania and in Vilnius. And then Russian minorities in the second place. But I would uh, first appeal to existence of schools and especially municipality funded schools because the essential difference of the uh, consensus in Lithuania after re-establishing independence was that every resident of the country has gained citizenship, uh, despite the fact whether he or she lived uh, in the realm of Lithuania before the Soviet occupation started, which is different policy rather than Latvia and Estonia has undertaken. And uh, also when it comes to education and cultural you know, provision for, uh, again, uh, Russians, Poles, and also Belarusians. So today in Vilnius, I would say we have uh, probably eight Polish schools that are fully funded by municipalities. We have probably six or seven Russian schools. Uh, we have one Belarusian uh, school as well, a high school. And this is the only actually uh, a school of this sort where you can start you know, from the primary school and finish your high school education fully taught in Belarusian and being outside of Belarus. Uh, so in this regard, you know, there are, and these are naturally important, you know, places and aspects of uh, ensuring that there is a consistency in, uh, in, 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 uh, in presence of, for instance, Belarusians in the Vilnius. And this has also been one of the factors why for Belarusian IT companies and Belarus has gained its uh, decent reputation for IT talent in the course of last two and three decades. So many Belarusian IT companies uh, have uh, indicated that their choice and prioritizing Vilnius over, for example, Riga, when it comes to the question of relocation, was driven by presence of education uh, and schools in Russian, or probably some of parents also decide to bring their kids to Belarusian school as well. So this is an important factor. Uh, I also would say that, for instance, in Vilnius, uh, there is a Catholic church where the uh, service is, provide, uh, is organized in Belarusian again. Uh, so there are, uh, you know, the, the, the different bits of that, but uh, naturally when it comes to presence of Belarusian intelligentsia and intellectuals, uh, Vilnius has also been an attractive point, even in practical terms, because the distance between Minsk and Vilnius is uh, 110 miles. And this is shorter than takes you to get from Minsk to Grodna or to Brest or to, you know, to, to Homel, uh, the other major you know, cities in Belarus. So it has been logistical aspect, but also the aspect of infrastructure, let's put it this way. And infrastructure has, has been nurtured uh, across decades because uh, what happened in the middle of 2000s is that in Belarus under Lukashenko back then, one of the most frequent uh, criminal charges for non-governmental organizations would be operations uh, on behalf of unregistered entity. And there was a number of, uh, of sound uh, cases and persecutions on that account. And therefore Belarusian NGOs uh, were forced to register parallel structures uh, in Vilnius uh, in order to be able to become recipients of foreign aid, mainly when it comes to support from, from Brussels, from Washington, from elsewhere, but also being able to employ their staff so there has been a certain also, uh, when it, uh, I wouldn't say that the job market for nonprofits and NGOs, but there has been certain experience gained in that regard. And ultimately what is very interesting is that uh, the know-how and the experience accumulated with uh, accommodating uh, Belarusian dissidents in Vilnius, Lithuania has become very, uh, very important in nowadays attraction of Russian dissidents to Vilnius as well. Because if we look at the people who are part of uh, Alexei Navalny's team and we look at other uh, non-Russian uh, human rights uh, defenders and organizations, many of them, they find exile also in Vilnius, Lithuania, which may look not as a natural destination because Tallinn and Riga may, be, may look closer geographically, but uh, apparently the experience gained with accommodating Belarusians has, be, uh, has proven to be uh, very, uh, very practical when it comes to also extending hand of support to Russian Democrats. Maximus, could I ask you, um, you know, there's kind of an underlying question. You mentioned Russia, and uh, I think President Putin has somewhat of the same dilemma, although it's on a different scale. But when a leader decides that they are going to pursue policies that make 
some of their citizens believe that they have to leave. And sometimes, as Michael was mentioning, they're the most educated, intellectually advanced in the society. Don't they damage their own society? And if they do, if you agree with that, why does Lukashenko seem uh, willing to have this many people leave who is left has it damaged his, uh, his economy? Has it damaged the IT industry? Well, uh, you know, Jill, in the opening remarks and when, uh, when you kindly presented me, you mentioned my recent uh, documentary series that I have produced on Lithuania National uh, TV, which is called uh, Talaka, and it's a 10-episode series about uh, the role of uh, Belarusian women in mobilizing the protest in Belarus. And all of these heroines, and 10 of them, they were forced to flee um, their homeland and then the Dublin Vilnius, Lithuania. Many of them, they mentioned the fact of survival's guilt. You know, something that you go through psychologically, right? When you, on one end, you realize that, well, you managed to escape being jailed. And uh, I have uh, these 10 extraordinary women uh, in the, you know, in the documentary. Uh, some of them, they are on Interpol list. Some of them, they are charged with criminal charges. Others, a few of them actually spent um, uh, 15 days under administrative arrest. So, you know, the, it's, it's not a theoretical debate when it comes to their own you know, freedom and, and, and being able to, to, to enjoy that. So, so they mentioned this aspect of survivor's guilt when they understand and realize that they are free now, but their, their families and their friends, um, they are experiencing this enormous wave of repression back home. Uh, and this is naturally very hard. It's not easy to, to, to live through that. And uh, this is naturally common for very, very many Belarusians who flee not only to Vilnius, but other places. Now, when it comes to blaming, I don't think we are in a position to blame uh, these people because once again, what happens now in Belarus, if we look just proportionally at the figures of uh, repression back home or back there, back in Belarus, it is the largest uh, example of political repressions on the European continent since the regime of black colonels in Greece. So, uh, because Belarus is a relatively small country, as I mentioned, 9.6, 9.5 million people. So we have over 40,000 people being detained in the last 15 months. We have uh, close to 850 political prisoners. We have over 3,000 criminal cases down there. We have at least 450 cases of tortures that were documented and submitted to United Nations Human Rights Council. We have uh, more than a handful of people being killed again. So uh, what more indicators are needed to alert? And this all has been happening in the immediate neighborhood of both EU and NATO, uh, because uh, the European Union and NATO countries have uh, over 1,100 kilometers of shared border with Belarus. So if we talk miles, it's almost 700 miles of shared border and, uh, that Bel Belarus has. So this is not in the periphery, but this is quite, quite, quite close to actually uh, the places where major decision making is done in, in Europe. Now, uh, uh, naturally, when Belarus enjoyed its economic growth, thanks to the IT talent, and thanks to creative, um, like creative industries uh, established there, uh, Lukashenko's regime could also flourish and prosper. Uh, it's a very kleptocratic regime, and the difference from uh, from you know, kleptocracy in Russia is that the economy in Belarus has not been privatized, it has not been reformed. So therefore it remains as a, as a Frankenstein of post-Soviet uh, planned economy monster, but yet at the same time trying to operate on, on, the, on, on the premium generated by IT industry. That was a pattern of how Belarusian economy worked for the last five, seven years. Uh, still enormous industrial complexes remain in Minsk and in other places of Belarus where you have tens of thousands of people employed, but all of them mostly being employed not on uh, full-time, but let's say on the quarter of just full-time you know, or half-time. Uh, so therefore, uh, Lukashenko makes sure that the so-called social contract is present, meaning that everyone is employed, uh, no one is jobless, uh, but they get, poor, get paid very poorly. So that was a pattern of his rule and of his you know, positioning himself as someone who can assure you know, stability in the country. Now, of course, when IT industry, which according to different estimations generated about 3.5% of Belarusian GDP is 
basically speaking is is close to to close to complete you know absence from the country and uh, there are still some of IT firms remaining to operate in Belarus but they are identifying the ways how to relocate their staff and in Minsk alone it was calculated before 2020 that around 110,000 people were economically dependent on IT industry meaning they were either directly employed or their immediate uh, immediate household members were employed in IT industry. So that has been, of course, most visible in places like Minsk that have enjoyed incredible growth in services and, uh, you know, and, and uh, the urban culture in the last five, six years. And these were actually the people, many of them, who have contributed to uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's campaign, to campaign of Viktor Babaryka, to campaign of uh, Mr. Tsipkala in 2020. Uh, so uh, I would definitely say that uh, IT industry has contributed and the talent of IT has contributed a lot to civil mobilization in Belarus in 2020. It's not that it has been the only source of mobilization, but it definitely has played a huge role also in instrumentalizing uh, protest in the ways never seen before in Belarus. For example, uh, since there has been no trust and no ability to verify how many votes are really counted uh, in favor of Lukashenko or anyone else, uh, Belarusians have managed to establish their own central electoral commission in a way, and, call, and that was an app called Golas, and you could submit your ballot, which would have been verified in, in the first place, and over one million Belarusians have actually submitted their ballots to that system and shown that they did not vote Lukashenko, they voted Tsikhanovskaya, or they voted anyone else. And uh, that has been also a new tool. So, you know, a, a merger between you know, digital tools and creativity uh, has, of course, distinguished 2020 from any uh, prior political mobilization in Belarus. And therefore, um, of course, people, hundreds of people, thousands of people living in Belarus, it hurts society, it hurts the economy. But when you are faced to choose between imprisonment and uh, fleeing, I would definitely say that this is not the choice any of us here present on the panel would like to make, right? Uh, so ultimately, there are reasons why people prioritize that. I wanted to jump in. Um, I've been communicating with Ala, and she really is having some major uh, computer problems. So she is very disappointed, but she's trying to find another computer. I hope that she will within the time uh, of this. But this is a really very interesting conversation, Maximus. Uh, and I wanted to remind people that we do want to have questions. In fact, the floor is open for anybody who wanted to ask questions. You can put them into the Q&A function. And uh, you know we can we can get to what people are interested specifically in. Um, you know I, I think um, Maximus, when we were talking about that, you were taking the focus. My the question that I asked a focus more on the people who leave and wouldn't that be damaging? I actually had Lukashenko in mind. You know and and also Putin. If this happens, doesn't it hurt them? But I guess the calculus sometimes is uh, political stability and control by a certain party or person is more important than what happens to the economy, I guess. But I, I just wanted to ask you, I have always found that Belarus is a, is a contradictory place because you have this man who's been in power since what, 1994, I think? So a very long time. He's considered, you know, as you said, it's kind of like it used to be considered a pretty Soviet country, even in modern days. And yet you have at the same time this IT, booming IT industry that develops. And then you have the way that uh, Lukashenko maneuvers with Putin. You know, he's not totally under control of Putin either. He got off the reservation just the other day by, uh, in kind of fury, saying, I'll cut off uh, natural gas that's coming from Russia via Belarus to Europe. And Putin said, I don't think that's a very good idea. So there's, it's, it's a complex relationship. Where do you think, I'm just trying to think how I formulate this question, but I think you know where I'm going. Can he carry on this balancing act indefinitely? I mean, isn't it eventually going to just, he'll run his own economy into the ground with this? Well, the paradox of Belarus and Lukashenko's rule has been that uh, someone who 
before effectively becoming you know this uh, horrific autocrat has just uh, been a, um, a chairperson of kolkhoz even not kolkhoz but sovkhoz in Moscow, in, in Mogilov district, and then for a brief time was a populist member of- oh, collective farm. We should jump in, a collective farm, you're saying, yeah. Collective yeah. farm. So, uh, and he managed to ensure, uh, and ensure his office and power for 27 years, and he does not have a degree from Yale or Harvard, right? He has a very practical understanding of life. So this is, of course, uh, extraordinary that uh, so many strategies and approaches have been applied towards Lukashenko, and still he managed to, to stay there, and probably because he has very good instincts. Uh, he has good instincts for survival, because this is not a fight over economy versus stability. No, it is everything against survival. And at this stage in time, Lukashenko, he doesn't... It's, it's an existential question for him. So therefore, the proportion of energy, the proportion of how, pri how it is prioritized for him is completely different, rather how it is, uh, you know, how, how, how it is prioritized by whether it be Brussels or whether, whether it be DC, because Lukashenko right now, he's fighting for his survival. And in that regard, uh, you know, if repressions work, then he'll be even more repressive. That's, uh, that's the end of story. And uh, therefore, uh, since uh, his uh, motives and his uh, aspiration to survival is driven rather by this uh, gang-alike uh, approach to life, by bullying, uh, more hostages you take, better it is. If Lukashenko could take the entire European Union hostages, that would be even better for him. So this is, this is how he defines, you know, bargain power. Now, when it comes to power dynamics between Kremlin and Minsk, when it comes to Lukashenko and Putin, right, they are not the best buddies, that definitely we can say. But at the same time, out of all bad options, this is the least bad option. Because uh, Lukashenko, despite having his own character and sometimes a certain level of unpredictability, still he's far more predictable over uncertainty, over something that can be different. So uh, and this is one aspect why Kremlin, after all, favors Lukashenko, why Kremlin, after all, supports Lukashenko. Maybe he is not the most beloved, uh, you know, uh, uh, creature of of, uh, of, of Kremlin, uh, but the and fun terrible, right? Uh, that's probably. But still, uh, Russia has enormous stakes when it comes to Belarus. Uh, it's impossible to find any sector of Belarusian economy, with a mere exception of IT industry, which is now close to non-existent, where Russian capital would not be dominating one. Uh, whether we take banks, whether you look at um, other aspects, of course. There is still some, uh, some, some, you know, uh, as they say, family silver left, family uh, silverware left, like uh, the uh, refineries in uh, Novopolotsk and in Mazir. When it comes to several uh, huge industrial complexes like Belaz and others, and of course uh, the potash industry. Uh, so whenever Lukashenko runs out of cash, he will be forced to of course, to sell these assets off to Russia, and that will happen uh, soon enough. But still, uh, it's not the question of economy. It's not the question of uh, relationship with Kremlin. It's first and foremost, the question of survival for Lukashenko. He'll do everything for that because there is no exit strategy for Lukashenko. And we should not be fooled by the idea that if we create a exit strategy in the West for Lukashenko, then he will peacefully uh, step down. No, it's a cruel regime, a personalistic regime, uh, a regime uh, close to, uh, something that was in uh, Romania. It's a Ceausescu style regime. Lukashenko doesn't have a party apparatus to rely on. It's very personalistic, very straightforward vertical of power, something what Nicolae Ceausescu had there with enormous security apparatus, which again has been the, uh, the, the, the feature of uh, you know, a socialist Romania. And so it's, I'm not implying that the end of Lukashenko regime will be the same as was the end of Ceausescu, but definitely there are certain similarities between those two regimes and he will not step down easy. So a certain level of naivety, a certain level of romanticism that was in the air in Minsk in August and September last year. And I was there in the streets of Minsk uh, observing uh, this incredible wave of solidarity and uh, uh, mobilization of people. Uh, it probably was not enough to make sure that the regime and the power vertical that has been being built by that moment, 26 years onwards, would be demolished. Additional impetus should be put in place. So ultimately, 
Belarusians will take care of their fate. This is up to them. This is not up to Kremlin or you know anyone else or not to Brussels or DC. But naturally, this regime is driven only by repressions and it will continue to do so as long as it is a question of its survival. You know, I see Ala there trying to join. I wonder if she can hear us or whether the connection worked. I think we'll wait a little bit on that, but there is a perfect question from our audience. And thank you, Jessica Myerson. It, it comes at the perfect time because here it is. Um, yeah, and there, Allah unfortunately just disappeared. I have a feeling this is not going to work. So Jessica Myerson's question is, Lukashenko and Putin recently agreed on 28 roadmaps for further integration between Belarus and Russia and agreed on unifying their gas markets by 2023. Do you think that the move to unify gas markets is a sign of Lukashenko giving in to the Kremlin for personal survival when normally he's able to extract concessions from Belarus energy relationship with Russia? Great question. What do you think, Max? Max it's, a, it's a great question. I think we could have a separate panel on that or maybe even an entire conference because the aspect of energy uh, energy in the power relationship between Kremlin and Minsk is definitely something worth uh, digging in into. But generally speaking, first, when it comes to the integration roadmaps, look, the so-called union state between Belarus and uh, Russia nominally exists starting from 1997, 1999. It depends on which of the treaties you count as uh, the founding ones. So it's been in place for over 20 years. And nothing of the points that were articulated in the initial treaty contradict actually something what are in these roadmaps. But furthermore speaking, uh, I recall, for instance, the debate in years 2001, 2003 over the uh, joint currency between Belarus and Russia. So there was an idea that there should be joint currency and um, that there should be single emission center. And guess what? 20 years onwards, uh, Russian ruble is still not the currency in Belarus. Right? It still has its own currency. Now, very practical and simple aspects like of abolishment of roaming tariffs for cell operators uh, between Belarus and Russia, right? Countries enjoy you know, close neighborhood. And this is something what in the European Union you have when you move across countries, you don't pay the roaming charges. Uh, Belarus and Russia have been in talks on abolishing roaming charges for at least last five years. And they didn't manage to do that although it seems such a small scale issue and which is, does not de demand enormous efforts, right? So uh, it is inevitable that Lukashenko has to sell off his assets year by year in order to uh, remain on the same financial model that he has created this, again, Frankenstein between in you know, a post-Soviet planned economy and at the same time, a fuel resources from Russia and the premium generated by IT industry. Yet at the same time, it's not the first uh, instance when uh, part of the energy infrastructure or the merger between energy infrastructure of Russian Belarus would take place. I recall that Beltransgas, which is the Belarusian entity in charge of transferring uh, gas uh, you know, from via the territory of Belarus, it was acquired in the end of 2000s. Uh, and uh, the sell-off, of course, uh, was a huge drama. So, but ultimately Lukashenko has sold off that pipeline and uh, somehow Belarus remained uh, a distinctive entity on the political map of the world for, for a decade at least. So uh, my point being here that these roadmaps are an inevitability of demonstrating a certain progress in relationship. Yet there has been no tangible progress beyond the fact that de facto uh, Belarus has been acquired by Russia a long time ago. So this is not a novelty. We can rather debate on the scope of autonomy or independence of Lukashenko in his decision-making. Uh, we can debate over when there will be full-fledged military base of Russia in Belarus, or it will remain as auxiliary uh, supplementary entities that have been there for over you know, 20 years already. So these are you know, just details. But in general speaking, these roadmaps are not a novelty at all. Right? They demonstrate a certain progress on something that has been already a fact. Yet at the same time, uh, it doesn't pay off for Russia to uh, annex Belarus. 
because it's a completely different case rather than Crimea, both in terms of its scope, in terms of its area, in terms of its population, and most importantly, when it comes to uh, when, when, when it comes to perception of Belarus in Russia, it's a very different sort of perception how Belarus is perceived there rather than how Crimea was and remains to be perceived by Russians in its overarching uh, you know, uh, narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Michael, is there anything? Uh, that yeah, you... I wanted to just jump in here. First of all, I want to encourage people in the audience to write in questions if you have them. It's a real shame about the uh, tech problems, but I'm really learning a lot from this from Maximus. And I just wanted to recall what you said at the very opening here, expressing some sort of um, um, misgivings about the fact that it, it took the current crisis at the border rather than all the repressions after the demonstrations to sort of galvanize you know, the EU. And we see Belarus coming into the news, you know, episodically when the in the West and in the US when the, the big demonstrations or now, but not constantly, right? That's why we're having this conversation. But I wonder, given the fact that the polls are not going to give in right now, and given the fact that there are those so many people in Vilnius, maybe this is a, a moment where the uh, Belarus will actually get more attention because of the current crisis, right? And because of the the, the people um, who are abroad. And that's one piece of the question. The other is sort of has to do with the, what we've been talking about, Russia, right? Um, I happen to spend a, some time in the Western part of the Russian Federation. A few years ago, all these academic projects between Russia and Belarus started to be promoted in places like Smolensk. And I want, you know, I, that was before the big demonstrations, but clearly on the Russian side, there's a sort of attempt to, to, to pour some more funding into ties between the Western parts of the Russian Federation and Belarus. So I just wonder, um, the, the question I would have would be if, if Lukashenko is really fundamentally weakened, whether that agenda would be strengthened. Well, uh, indeed, uh, when it comes to uh, factors like uh, the ongoing migration crisis or hijacking of the you know, Ryanair flight, which took place in May, so these episodes, they drive the attention, Belarus um, emerges on the headlines. But then uh, it is also important to outline another risk, which can be the case, and this is a migration crisis serving as a smokescreen for Russia's military deployment when it comes to Ukraine's borderland. And uh, this is also a very worrying development. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the duet of uh, Minsk and Moscow, uh, you know, being able to divert uh, attention on different fronts should not be underestimated, right? And uh, when it comes to distraction, when it comes to uh, in infuring uh, doubt, and, and the insurance and decisiveness, this is what Kremlin proved to be quite uh, successful uh, in, its, uh, in its approach to, to the West. And, uh, and this is uh, you know, one of the possible worrying developments that is there. And uh, uh, what, when it comes to the second part of, 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 of your question, uh, of course, uh, there are different groups of interests in, in Russia and uh, for some of them, uh, the more nationalistic ones, uh, there were several attempts in trying to ensure uh, the similar, similar sentiment in Belarus. And in certain parts of Belarus, especially in eastern Belarus in cities like Vitebsk, you can definitely see that there is a certain, uh, there, there is more of that uh, sentiment when it comes to even the symbolics, uh, you know, the, uh, that, that, uh, that are used by, you know, Russian regime. And you can, you know, frequently hear that also among people talking but overwhelmingly, uh, Belarus is not as, um, as, as fragmented as, for instance, Ukraine is. So the differences between Western Belarus and Eastern Belarus, they can be some, but they're not substantial. They're not structural. And they're not even confessional. Let's put it this way. It is generally considered that Western Belarus is Catholic and Eastern Belarus is Orthodox. But actually, Mogilo, which is a city, one of the main cities in Eastern Belarus, is one of the main Catholic centers of Belarus. So it's it's not, and Brest at the same time, which is a city in Western Belarus, just in, you know, on a few kilometers, a few miles away from the border with Poland, is uh, 
is quite pro-Russian in many regards, Siri. And so uh, the, it, it's not that straightforward when it comes to alignment of geography of Belarus and the sentiment understanding. And uh, over uh, the sociological research that has been conducted across the last decade, it seems that Belarusians, they prefer to remain in the moderate standing. So they are not indicating uh, strong pro-European sentiment, but neither strong pro-Russian sentiment. They try to position themselves to, pro, pro, to present themselves as if uh, Switzerland of Eastern Europe, whatever that stands for. Uh, and in that regard, so there is a, that, that is a certain pattern of, of, of Belarusians in general, the empathy and trying to find, you know, to accommodate all you know, groups of interest and points of view. But definitely I can agree that there has been an increase of uh, when it comes to Belarusian academia and especially when it comes to, for example, places like Belarusian Academy of Sciences, and major public universities in Belarus that have been intensifying cooperation with, uh, with Russia. Yet at the same time, they were also using uh, funds and resources provided by EU, by programs like Erasmus+, Plus, by programs like Horizon 2020, and others to also support things. And uh, normally the project that would be carried out together, they would rather attach non-sensitive issues. So they would rather be, you know, general methodology improvement, capacity building and things, but not actually fostering critical thinking of students, let's say, or, you know, or fostering critical debate over history and political sciences and, and so on. So yeah. they, they, they try to work with both. Maximus, you know, I'm looking at the clock. I always hate to be the traffic cop here. We have like three minutes left. So, um, and I want to thank Ala for her valiant attempts to try to get in. Uh, she's really been trying, but it apparently is not working and I'm very sorry. But let me end with this, you know, as a uh, kind of former journalist, we have to wrap up with something, something breaking news, something interesting. So um, let me ask you this, as you look at this, this very serious situation on the border, you said Poland's not going to back down. Uh, we don't know exactly what Belarus is going to do. How do you think this is going to be resolved, Maximus? And you have two minutes <laughs> to answer that. I think there are two pathways how this will be resolved. What Lukashenko seeks is uh, so that the resolution of this situation would bring Lukashenko to the table. He is now not at the table. He wants to be at the table because this legitimizes him and this allows him to to make the present status quo a new norm, a new business as usual paradigm. And this would be possible if uh, the bullying and the using of the West's and particularly European Union's vulnerability will go on, if there will be no resilience and no strong standing on behalf of the EU. Brussels at this point of time demonstrates an ambiguity. On one end, it is very strong in its rhetorics, and the incoming Chancellor Scholz has been also very strong when it comes to rhetorics on Lukashenko. But yet at the same time, it still uh, lacks decisiveness. In the, and mostly the politics of the EU towards Belarus are driven by uh, pushing from Vilnius, from Warsaw and from Riga. Uh, so therefore it is uh, the ultimate the decision-making time for the Brussels, where the Brussels is eager to stand for its values and for what it proclaims as its orientee, or rather it would prefer making things you know, forgotten and you know, switching back to the business as usual. Unfortunately, we had more of the demonstrations of critical engagement and re-engagement with Belarus in the past. So therefore, although I'm very pro-EU uh, and pro-transatlantic, but I believe that uh, there are still risks involved. And there are definite risks that we may lose this fight with Lukashenko where brutality becomes superior to undecisiveness and uh, correctness of Brussels. Mm. Well, that's a sad note to uh, end on, but it's been a really fascinating discussion. And Maximus Milta, thank you very much for uh, really your, your great knowledge of the area and the issues that we've been discussing. I wanna thank the audience for the uh, good question. And I hope the next time there will be more. And also uh, Michael David Fox, our new director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian and East European Studies. Uh, thank you for your knowledge of the re region and those uh, excellent comments and questions. And then finally, I want to, um,
thank Ceres for uh, hosting this and also the Carnegie Corporation of New York for funding it. We really appreciate it. And uh, I will give you a plug for next month that everybody has to look forward to. Uh, Ceres will be having a set, an entire session, several sessions on the 30th anniversary of the end of the Soviet Union. It will be fascinating. And uh, part of this will be the Russia brief that I conduct. And our subject is going to be on Soviet nostalgia. And I can tell you that already I've had uh, several people, most of whom are Russian themselves, uh, get into a big discussion. In fact, I would describe it as a fight over whether there actually is such a thing as Soviet nostalgia or not. So I think it's going to be a, a hot subject and it's a fascinating subject. So I hope you will be able to join us. We'll be putting out announcements for the links for that. So again, thank you very much, Michael David Fox, Maximus Milta, and also Ala Luka Vietz, who was here briefly, and uh, we hope that sometime she can come back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you.